Okay, welcome everybody. We're back, Tanya 2.0. I think this is class 16. Not that it really matters because we're just in the middle of parakeet bees. We are learning about the Benoni and I have to give a shout out to my sister-in-law, Elke, who's here today. Um, all the way from Houston. Um, it's so funny, I feel like they have this also in Florida. Like people don't have camp second half. I'm like, why don't you have camp second half? Like where did that come from? Like it's like an out of town thing or it's like- kids on beach day I know. I'm not getting in that headspace of like summer's over yet because like I like live by Labor Day so I'm like okay we have time we have time um okay so we'll just like briefly recap where we were holding we were learning about who were we learning about she's talking in class she's passing notes like I was the worst by the way like I saw had nightmares from like Mrs. Birmingham in seminary when she would be like calling and she'd be like hey and I'm like I don't even know what paracord is. Like, I have no idea what safer we're learning. Like, and then you want to question the aisle. <laughs> I know, I, I don't question her because I realize it's her. She called me the other day, she's like, ma, don't say anything. I'm like, what? Okay, I shouldn't put this online. Whatever, she did something in camp that like, and I'm like, I'm so proud of you. And she's like, that's not usually what mommy is saying. Like, usually mothers are like, no, because I'm like, I'm so proud that you like pulled that off, you know? Um, but, okay, so we were talking about the Benoni. So there were three, hi, how are you? There are three main characters that the Balatani refers to. So we started in chapter 10, we spoke about the Tzadik, okay? We spoke about two types of Tzadik, then we moved on to chapter 11, which Shaytab was always like, it's bankruptcy, it's the bad guy, it's the Russia, and we spoke about two types of Russians. But we did remind ourselves that like, Russians, as like much as we think they're psychopaths, like also it could be us. Like, not that we should be disheartened, but just not thinking that a Russia is like the scary evil guy. And we said that Russia is involved with Ra, but Ra is really selfishness and it's just not associated with Hashem. Okay? So we have two types of Tzaddik, two types of Russia, and now in chapter 12, Parakeet Bees, we are learning about the Benoni. So what do we know about the Benoni? And where basically this Sefer is called Sefer Benoni. So if like there was an important parak, it's this parak. This is who we are striving to be. Everything else is like filler or whatever, but we have to understand who this character is because this is what we're striving for. It's a person that what? What's, what does the Benoni deal with? Internal struggles. What about his external struggles? Wait, you said you're not coming today. No. Oh, you said on the poll that you are coming? Yeah. I was like, okay, fine. But I thought only four people. I do coming. look at the poll because I'm like, do I have to stress about my cheers? <laughs> no. um, so Benoni has internal struggles, but, um, but on external, he's always perfect. Okay, so it's a very, very hard thing. As much as we're like, oh, a Benoni is somebody who sometimes does good and sometimes does bad. No, he always does good but he has constant internal struggles. So he has the impulses of a Russia, okay, like chapter 11. He has those impulses. He thinks about doing bad. He thinks of being jealous. He thinks of eating before Havdalah. He thinks of eating before Kiddush Friday night, which has like become the hardest thing in the entire world for me because like I would eat a full on meal Friday night and now it's like, no, I have to wait for Kiddush. And then I'm like, hmm, but I need to taste the cucumber salad, but I need to dress this salad, you know? And then also like, I'm always like, we're Hasidish, so like we could eat. My mother and I full on meal in the kitchen before my father came home. My father was the last one to come home from shul, like worse than my husband. Um, and I mean, I'm actually, we just wait. We just like sit and wait. Like it's a normal thing, like two hour davening, Friday night, two and a half hours. So the not eating Friday night is very hard, but all I know is that these are internal struggles that I have, but the Benoni does not act upon it. So I had it, obviously, of course, we're learning about the Benoni, so it happened to me, the Shabbos, I was by my in-laws. And we walked there Shabbos lunch and there was a lot of company and it came like a certain point of the day where I'm like, I need to get home. Like, you know, when you're like, oh, it's so nice, but like all of a sudden you're like, just transport me. Like, I need to be home, I need to get out of there. And it's Shabbos and there was no car and it was raining. And I didn't bring a double stroller and I had one stroller and a scooter. So I'm like looking at my daughter who hates to walk, okay? <laughs> she's seven and she could be in a stroller till she's 12, she's fine. And it's raining and I have a scooter and I had to get home and one carriage and like, my baby dropped his blanket on the floor and it got wet and I'm just like, oh my goodness, so I'm walking down the block and my in-laws live in Woodmere, like back Woodmere, like nobody's there, there's nobody in the block. So I'm walking down the block, like losing it on my seven-year-old, like pull it together, we have to get home, get on the scooter, no, no, no. And then like all of a sudden out of nowhere, this like lady like comes in, I'm like, Jewish. Like, she sees me like yelling at my kid and then I'm like, oh, and then she was actually not just Jewish, she was like nicely from and she was wearing a tichel and she's like, we all have one of those children. And I'm like, yeah, we do. And I just like, I was like, hey, pull it together. And then I have to walk the whole block with her and just pretending that everything's fine. And I was like realizing that that's the skill of the Benoni. To be able to in one second say, somebody's watching me, I can't do this. All my internal struggles that I feel, 
I can immediately stop. I will, because I'm not a psychopath. I also feel bad about what I did, and I realize, no, that's not it. Okay, so the rest of the 20 minute walk, and then it stopped raining, and then it got nice, and then we started having conversations, and it was fine, and it wasn't screaming and crying, but it, it's a gift that's given to us. It's a natural thing that we have that the second that we feel we wanna control our behavior, we can control our behavior. So that's really where we left off last week. That concept of like moach shalat al-alayb, where we were just starting to explain it, we're gonna explain it a little bit more. Today is that every human has this ability built in within them, and it's up to us like how much we wanna perfect it. And the more you perfect it, the better you get at it. It's just like weights. It's like the more you control yourself in one area, you're like, I could do this the whole day. I could do it for an hour. And you see that you strengthen it. Now, um, We'll continue from here. Okay, any questions on the Benoni and what he, what the Moshe Adalib? This is, by the way, the first explanation of Moshe Adalib. We're going to go into like three more explanations of it, but the first one is impulse control, right? We all have it. Some kids don't. Some kids struggle with it. It's a thing. They don't have impulse control, put them on meds, right? But realizing that everybody has the some kind of ability for impulse control. Okay, so now we'll continue. We'll go on. We left off like literally by like, and then we were talking about Mamashas and Hai Shifra. We don't only do, don't only do net activities, we also learn. Um, it's fun. It's fun having a big family. My husband's the oldest of 11, so it's like, you get together, it's like, net activity, like, that's literally what it is. Um, okay, so it says, Kimach Shalat Al-Aleid, but told also, Ubeteva Yitzi or so, that it's naturally, it's you're in your capacity, that the brain rules over your heart, it says it in the Zohar, Shekach Notzar HaAdam Betoldo So, for this is how man was formed at birth. At birth, we have this instinct to be able to control ourselves. As we get a little bit older, by the way, we work on it better. Who do you, th where does these impulses come from, by the way? Like I'm saying, everybody's born with the ability to control it, but what comes first? Remember like our souls, when our souls came into this world, like what, the way that we're made up of, what's the part of us that comes to us first? Nefesh Bahamas. So the Nefesh Bahamas is the emotion. It's the emotional one. It's like the reckless one, right? And that's the one that's in the heart. Where are these impulses coming from? We're saying that uh, the Benoni, he controls his impulses. He controls his impulses. Where are they coming from? Who sent them? Through, Hashem sent it through, Satan. through the Satan. What's another name for the Satan? The Sitra Ahura, the Nefesh Bahamas. That's how we're made. We are built, the first thing that we were created with, remember, let's go all the way back to the beginning, was a Nefesh Bahamas. And that Nefesh Bahamas is the control center for all your emotions, whether you like them or not. Some of them are intrusive, some of them are bad. Like, oh, do you ever like, okay, they are like, it sounds crazy, but like, are you ever on a bridge and you're like, oh, I'm in the right lane. Oh, imagine if my car fell off. Like, what would I do? And I'm like, open the windows while we're going off the, because like you always see in the movies that like the windows like like you have these intrusive thoughts right where are they coming from anybody else am i the only one who thinks that <laughs> right i'm like driving the middle lane so we don't fall off nobody falls off happens to be yesterday though i was driving and on the george washington bridge there were people like on the you know like like a bridge has like those the things to hold the strings right the suspension yeah. part they were like on it like a roller coaster you know like when you go up a roller coaster like that thing i was like Oh my god! And then I'm like, oh, I hope they're attached, or whatever. But like, you were first, driving, right? I was. You, you, you yourself. I was driving, and I was like looking up at them. Yeah, I know. And I was like videoing it because like there was a new song coming out, and like, <laughs> right. But where are these intrusive thoughts coming from? Like, where are these crazy things coming from? It's coming from your Nefesh Bahamas. Your Nefesh Bahamas wakes up every single day and is like, ooh, I'm gonna get in the car first. I'm gonna control the city. So he like puts out bids. Like it starts like giving you like these thoughts, and. It's like, who's gonna win? Which thought is gonna actually make it out into action? Okay, so like, first intrusive thought of the morning is like, I'm trying to think, like, I don't wanna be so dark, but like, sometimes we have these like, right, I know, I'm thinking dark because I'm thinking like jumping off a bridge, but not like that, or just something, like a feeling, like, oh, I kinda wish what she always, like, I kinda wish I had what she always had. And I'm like, oh, she doesn't even deserve that thing that she has. And then I'm just like, oh my goodness, who is that? Where's that coming from? It's like, you know, like Ellie and the Little White Lie. It's like Mayor and me. It's like, where's that voice coming from? Everybody has those voices. Everybody has those intrusive thoughts. Everybody has those feelings that arise and bubble up. But the question is, how much of the moach will shall it alalev? How much of your brain is going to rule over that? So it's normal to have those feelings. Remember we spoke about this? We like normalized these feelings last week. They come up, but how high are they going to go? So the, like the muscle that like... Um, it's a good muscle that Chase Tab was giving. It's like almost like a burp. It's like it's coming from somewhere inside of you, right? Like, you know, your little kids, they burp, and you're like, oh, control yourself. And you're like, well, I can't control myself. 
honestly, like if you're in a room with a lot of people, you'll control your breath, right? Like you'll be able to figure it out. Like you could hold it in, right? But it's coming from somewhere inside of you and it's trying to make its way up and it wants to come out. So it's like the thought, we think our thoughts come from here, but our holy thoughts come from here, but our unholy thoughts come from here, from our next Muhammad. So they come up and you have the ability to say, no, swallow that burp, right? Or just like let it out slowly. <laughs> right? Like, don't like, you, but like when little kids do it, they're like, I don't have any control. You're right, because when you're younger, you don't have so much impulse control. Because when you're younger, remember, you only have your nefesh of So you act out on all your impulses, and you just wreak havoc on everything. And then you try to go upstairs and tell your brain, like, no, this is good behavior. I'm going to control myself. Like, I see my daughter when she's having a meltdown, right? Like, she's freaking out about something. And I'm just like, control yourself. And then she's like, I am going to calm down. And I'm like, okay, it's a great technique to learn to calm down. And it literally pushes those feelings down. There's, like, this amazing series. Um, I used it for, like, social skills training. Um, one of the books is called Soda Pop Head, I feel like. Did I ever tell you about this? It's like this book about, it's about this boy, Lester, who has like a lot of anger and he, he literally, the muscle is that it's like a fizz, fizz cap, and if you shake him up too much and you open it up, he's gonna lose it and he's gonna lose control. But you have the ability, there are techniques that we learn to control yourself, to bring it back down, to like literally bring that burp or bring that feeling or bring that instinct and squash it down and say, no, Figgy, no, don't go on your day with that. Don't think those things. And it's really, it's such willpower, it's such control. It feels like you're on the best diet in the entire world. It feels like when you have control over something, like a healthy diet, not like where you're not eating anything, right? Like, no, you have to balance it out. So that's really what he's describing over here. He says, Shakal Adam no shol beruach tavaso shabalibo. That this means that any person, any person can, with that willpower of his brain, restrain himself and take control of his heart's urges to divert his attention somewhere else. And now he gives such a good mashal. And this is why like, I really love Tanya because it doesn't just teach you like, okay, you could have self-control. It teaches you the mechanics of what self-control is. Like the way that he describes it, he gives a mashal, Bifrat al Sad HaKadusha. He said, this is particularly true when you're attempting to coerce your will into the direction of holiness. So let's say you have a will. You have something, you're thinking about something. And now you want to curb it to holiness, right? Because we said, what's the other side? Sitra Akhra's the other side, it's selfish. It's things that I'm thinking about or I want to do just for myself, not for Hashem. So what does it say? It says, And I saw, and this is um, pretty, far, pretty sure from Shlomo Melech, and I saw that there's an advantage to wisdom over stupidity. Okay? Like there's an advantage to being smart over being foolish, like the advantage of light over darkness. Okay, so now foolishness, like stupidity and wisdom, that's like a little bit hard to understand. Let's put that to the side. Let's understand light and darkness, okay? First of all, you should just know that foolishness and stupidity is like when we say like ruach shtos. What's a ruach shtos? That's like stupidity, like silliness, right? We say that like, and we'll, he'll bring it down. He says that, that like Rabbi Seno Zichronam Levracha, we, I feel like I remember this quote from school, something, somebody remind me, Shifra. That nobody really does anything wrong unless a ruach shtos came upon them. Do you remember that one? I feel like that was like a chazal, no? Like a mamre chazal. Like nobody really does anything wrong only if a ruach shtos comes upon you. So what's this ruach shtos? So in order to understand it, Valtani gives a mashal of light and dark. And I feel like I love this so much because he gives so many mashalim, but when it comes to light and darkness, it's, it's literally perfect. It's like, okay, let's say there's darkness in the room, right? It's pitch black in the room, there's a blackout, right? The second somebody brings light into the room, a candle into the room, what does that do? A little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. But it's not like when you're packing a suitcase and you're trying to fit things in, right? So it's like, okay, I wanna fit my entire bed into this little suitcase, because I was like, I'm only traveling with carry-on. By the way, like these days, it struggles real. Like everybody loses their luggage. I'm like, no, I'm not losing my luggage, I'm only taking it. But not everything's gonna fit. So as soon as I started packing my stuff, I had to take something else out. I'm like, okay, fine, I don't really need this outfit. It's just an extra one, just in case. Like, if I go running, please, I'm not gonna end up going running. I'm on vacation. Like, pack maybe another Mimu Maxi, right? As I'm putting things in, I have to take things out. When it comes to darkness and light, the second you bring a candle in the room, it's not like, oh my goodness, where should we put the darkness? Like, let me pack it up. Like, let me put it somewhere. Let me put it in a garbage bag. Like, let me fill it. It doesn't even take up any space. The darkness doesn't have to go anywhere. All you have to do is bring the light in. And so many times we think like, oh, I'm thinking something silly or I'm about to act and do something wrong. And you're like, oh my God, I want to change. Okay, so let me say Nishmas for 40 days and let me meditate for 20 minutes and let me go to the aisle. You don't have to. All you have to do is bring the light into the room and then the darkness disappears. 
All you have to do is bring in a little bit of kayach, like a, not kayach, a little bit of moach, <laughs> rhymes, a little bit of like your wisdom, a little bit of your intellect, a little bit of your nefesh kiss, And all you have to do is bring him in, literally just like call his name, and then that's it. That stupidity leaves. You don't have to work so hard. You don't have to pack up the darkness. You have to, your suitcase, whenever in physical space, it's something like that. But what Baal Tani is saying is that the, the behind the scenes of Moch Shalt Aleid is really the same way that light takes over darkness. You don't have to start overthinking your impulse control. The second you start overthinking it, you're gonna end up in a bad place and you're gonna be like off the bridge with your windows rolled out. Like, you don't wanna be in that space. You wanna be able to just take control of the situation immediately and you can by bringing a candle in. What's the candle? The candle, the light is always Torah. It's always intellect. It's always something from your nefesh locus that will feed and will like, It'll calm your nefesh of Bahamas down. Remember, your nefesh of Bahamas is ravenous. It's like wakes up in the morning and all it wants to do is take over. And it's like, please, can I just have your feet today? Can I just have your hands today? Can I have your eyes today? Right? Like, we think about the things. Okay, we try not to dwell on the things that we do bad, but like when you do, it's like, oh my God, I have such good lush and hard to tell you. And you're like, really? And then the more it travels up and up and up, while that's happening, what the Nefesh Bahamas does, because it's so strong, it starts talking to the brain, and it tells the brain that it's okay, and it's for tachlas, right? And, and it's you know lito elas, right? You know and then it's out. out. Yeah. Right. Scary. So it's such a scary thing, but it's so much in your control, and the second that you're struggling with it, just think of the light and the candle coming into a dark room. It's pitch black, you put on your flashlight, boom. You didn't pack the darkness anywhere, but all of a sudden you can see. So you didn't have to start hiding all your bad behaviors and all your bad tendencies and all the things that you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know if anybody does this, but like after, like you eat one donut and then you're like, give me the whole Dunkin' Donuts, right? Like you, you're like, I heard one piece of Lush and Heart, can you just tell me all the gossip, right? Like I did this, okay, forget it, it doesn't even matter, right? It's not true because every single time you have the control over light, over darkness, you can do the same thing, stupidity, your intellect over your stupidity or your moral shalt only. So that's like the inner workings of it. And then he takes it one step further. He says, okay, so should I just read it in Hebrew once? We have a minute. Okay. Uberfrad al tzad hakadusha, just like this on the holy side. Hashem always says that like, when you are being coerced into the direction of unholiness, that's where, when you start feeling yourself being drawn to something inside of you, that's where, that's when I saw that there's an advantage to wisdom over stupidity, like the advantage of darkness over, of light over darkness. Shema'at are a little bit of light, gashmi, physical light, actually, physical light, docha harbe menachoshach. That in physical, a small amount of light will push away a lot of darkness. There's no struggle between light and darkness because light and darkness, they don't fight against each other. The light automatically wins. It will automatically win. He doesn't have to work so hard. Um, and in the same way, just like the stupidity of the klipa of the sitra achra, that's from the left side of your heart. Remember, because we said that everything that's bad is coming from the left side. It's not bad, sorry. It's sitra achra. From the left side, everything will be pushed away. So a small amount of light will push away a lot of darkness. And evil strength is very, is, is tangible, right? Let's say evil or like selfishness strength is very tangible when you feel it, but its weakness can be, it's gone. It, like it looks so scary. I feel like maybe this is what anxiety looks like. Like it looks really scary, but then like when you snap your fingers, like it could disappear. It's not really there, but it feels so there. And the more we practice, I, if you want to snap your fingers or light candles, every time I light a candle, I start thinking this. I mean, I just started, I just learned this last week, so I'm starting this week. But when I light a candle, I'm thinking, wow, like that candle has such control over this dark room. Or even when it's a light room, it still has control over the room. And that, that's instantaneous. And that's how my behavior could be. So he says, like our sages say, that a person does not do anything wrong unless a delusional spirit, delusional sounds like really scary, um, because the delusion doesn't come from here. The delusion comes from your animal soul and it can be instantly dispelled by the wisdom of the divine soul found in the brain. Remember the city? It always brings up the city again. Who's gonna be in control of the small city? And Nefesh kiss is like, I gotcha, don't worry. Just bring in a candle, think about it for one second, bring me into the room, just like literally like, let me even come into the trunk of your car, right? The animal soul's like, I got the keys, I'm in the car first, I'm driving. And then Nefesh kiss is like, just put me in the trunk and light me up, and then that's it. And then like, I don't know, sometimes I do this, like we're in the car and like, 
everything's going really not so great until we got everybody in the car and then we realize that somebody needs a diaper change and then it's like really bad but then like somehow like music or like something like changes the whole car <laughs> you know <laughs> you go to the blanket store <laughs> That was traumatized. We drove to and from Waterbury in like a matter, it was like five hours, but we spent like six hours in the car. Like somehow, like the car time was longer than the actual bus mitzvah time. And my kids were crying the entire way there and the entire way back, like asking for, what? she was cold and she just wanted a blanket? Target. She wanted a target. Tell me when we find the target. Tell me when you find the target. Right, so like music really loud can dispel a lot of noise, right? Or like sometimes we listen to story tapes. Now Mindy Warsh has these amazing stories. I don't know if you've seen it on YouTube, like little stories from the daf, like just something to change, the, like a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. If it's a little bit of music or if it's a little bit of Torah or it's a little bit of meditation, a little bit of thinking, you have that control and that's all it's asking for because then once it comes in, what does it do? Ula so it wants to express itself in the three garments, right? Remember, thought, speech, and action. So it's saying that the Nefesh Habahamas is like, I got into the car first. Too bad. Same seats, no matter, matter what, right? Like, I don't care. That's a saying that they say in the Bloomsteins that, like, do you have that? Like, when the kids get into the car on the way back from something and they're like, same seats. No? No, is it only I'm nobody? No, right? Everyone. I know. We have to like go. Like when I sit in the back everyone. seat, I like ask my kids, "Let me, how do you fit in here?" Like I can't even. Like I could climb over, but then I'm there, and I'm like, "What do you do?" Like yeah. Um, okay, so the basically overall, before we get to the next section of like who really the Benoni is, the point is that when you have light, you don't really have to think about the darkness. So when you have wisdom, you don't have to think about those negative traits. And it's not delusional to think like this. It's not, it's real. Because you have to believe that your light, that your chachma, that your learning, that your connection to your nefesh kiss will convert your nefesh hamahamis. It doesn't matter, it doesn't take a lot to do. You don't have to pack him up anywhere. So that's really what we have to take away. Okay, so, um, and if you have the foolishness and if you have that intrusive thought, you immediately replace it and it's instantaneous. Just like light takes over the room, your chachma will change you. Okay? By the way, your Chachma, like your Chabad, your Chachma Bina Das, over your emotions, is the whole real essence of Chabad Chasidas. Right? Like, what? remember when we started in the beginning, I don't know if anybody remembers, like, all the way back, what, what does Chabad represent? Chachma Bina Das. And then there was, like, this, this other form of Chasidas that said, we're Chagas, which is Chased, Gvura, Teferis. Right? And their whole thought process was emotion leads you to your intellect. Chabad is intellect leads you to your emotions. As opposed to, let's say, nanachs, right? Like Breslau Chassidus, which I'm going to be learning now. I just started learning with Elkie's husband, by the way. He does a hustle and grow. It's amazing. It's like one minute Rabbi Nachman clips. Um, it's actually really good. Um, I'm starting to like type them up for my classes. Um, and it, it's Breslau Chassidus is very much connecting to your emotion first and then letting your brain think, right? Think about like, what's our imagery of like Breslau Chassidus? Dancing, right? Why are they dancing? They, they have a, a teaching from Reb Nachman that you have to dance for 30 minutes a day. You know, like, just getting your kids up, like, sometimes, and just, like, dancing them, even though sometimes you feel ridiculous. This was one of the things that my father used to always do. Like, every morning, he would do, like, a rikita with us. He would dance with us in a circle, moda'ani. Like, it was the most normal thing. And he would open his feet, and then we would, like, climb under and go around, and then somebody would sit on us, and then I would cry because my brother was much heavier and he would sit on my back like it was like a whole like rec like every morning we had a rekidala and dancing and I'm like now I'm thinking like whoa was my father a breast of chassid I, that feeling of just getting up and moving and getting your emotions to move and then learning Torah I don't know we used to have this in camp we had to do calisthenics in the morning <laughs> <laughs> do you remember Chip's gold like I remember like coming to the gym in camp and I'm like, what are we doing? And she is like there with a baseball cap and like base skirt and like dancing. I'm like, could you just dive in? Like, could, why do we have to do this? And it was like, I almost felt like it was a punishment, but I was like, there was movement before diving. So 7.30 calisthenics. I don't even know what calisthenics means, but like that's what we had. And then eight o'clock was davening. That was chagas. That was get your emotions flowing and then you could come to daven. Chabad Hasidus is Chabad. What's Chabad? Chabad is Chachma bin Adas over your emotions. Moach Shalit Alali, that everything really stems from over here. From your head, from your from your intellect, from your nefesh kiss, will then have control over it. So even if it tries to come up, you say, no, we don't do that, go back down. 
I think of it sometimes as acid, maybe just as somebody who has, suffers from acid reflux, where I'm like, no, you have to go down there. And by the way, the more you push it down, the more you actually like, now we're getting into the technical part of like, I just went to the gastro, right? So it's like the esophagus, when you push it back down, it hurts, right? But that's what we have to do. We have to push those ugly emotions, those parts of us that we're not happy with, push it down and it will dispel it. Okay. Questions? I feel like we're doing a ton today, like a lot of inside. Okay, fine. So, So now this is like section four of this parak, and it says, who's the deep core of this benoni? Who is he? So as much as you think about it, nevertheless, it says, despite absolute mastery over his thought, speech, and action, it says, he's not called a tzaddik. Now, not the tzaddik that we refer to as Amit Kulam Tzaddikim, because every year really is a big tzaddik. In our shul, they have like parking, by the parking spots, it says, you know, reserved for, and it's like reserved for a big tzaddik. Every year it's a big tzaddik, like it's a joke, but it's, it's actually really true. Every year it is a big tzaddik, but the tzaddik in Tanya language is a different type of tzaddik than the Amit Kulam Tzaddikim. So what is this tzaddik? This, this, who is this Benoni? It says, Mipnei Yisran Hazat, that this, who is he? Asher la'ar nefesh alokish al ha'choshef, the sikhle shal klipa nitcha mimela, that the advantage that he has, and by the way, he does have an advantage. Why does, it, why does the Benoni have an advantage over a tzaddik? He can work towards something. He's working towards something, right? The tzaddik will work his way through his own through his own, you know, like everybody on their own growth chart, like a court, like we, we joke because my kids are short, so like Bloomstein growth chart, like, oh, they're doing amazing on the Bloomstein growth chart, right? But like, as they go up on their own chart, same thing here, the Benoni has the ability to strive to so much more. But why is he? He's saying that he's not even, don't ever think he's a tzaddik. You shouldn't think. Because like, a tzaddik wakes up perfect. By us, like, okay, I know this is not like a right muscle for Valtania, but like, I never finished this series of Marvelous Miss Maisel, although when I first watched it, like one of the first episodes is, I don't know if anybody watched it, it's great, she's Jewish, it's good Jewish humor. She goes to sleep at night, like looking perfect, and then like her husband goes to sleep, and then she wakes up in the morning, she sets her alarm like two hours earlier, and she like puts her hair in rollers, makes everything perfect. Oh no, 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 after her husband goes to sleep, she puts her hair in rollers, takes out all her makeup off, you know, like the equivalent to like what we look like with those laser masks that people put on, and like, you know, cucumbers, and she like sleeps like that, and then when she wakes up in the morning, he's still sleeping, and she goes out of bed, takes out her rollers, wakes up with like perfect lipstick, right? Like that, that's almost like what the tzaddik is like, right? The tzaddik wakes up perfect. But really, the inner workings of a Benoni is that, like, he's like, you think I woke up like this? Like, no, this took hours, right? Like, I always, like, think of, like, these people who go onto the news very early, like, 6 o'clock, 6 a.m. news. I'm like, are they, like, getting ready at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning? They are, right? I know. They don't sleep, right? They're getting their feet on. Oh, makeup at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning is, like, breast makeup that, like, I don't handle. I started realizing, like, just don't wear makeup to a breast. It's, like, much better. There's something very off about, like, putting makeup on at, like, 7 o'clock in the morning. You know, like, just light mascara. But the baby only wakes up like that. He's, like... You think I just woke up like this? No. Like, I went to the Sheetal Mahar, and I did my brows, and I got everything done, and I got it, and here I am. I showed up like this. This is perfection with working on it. And that's the glory of the Benoni. He's like, I'm not perfect, but I show up as perfect because I really, really work on myself. So what he's saying is, like, basically, I don't roll out of bed like this. Like, this is not, this is a lot of work. So what is his, what is his, what's, what's the behind the scenes of it? That it's not in his mahus. The outward expression is perfect, but his mahus is struggling. So he says, maybe outwardly I per look perfect. And by the way, like I think about this all the time. Like, you know, when you see people and you're like, oh my gosh, our lives are so perfect. I don't know why we were talking about this last week. You have no idea what's going on inside. You have no idea what the internal struggles are. And that's such a good way to think of a Benoni. Like when you find out that somebody was mama struggling and you're like, what? You can't tell. There was always that kid when we were kids in school. Like that one kid was like really rich and had an elevator in her house. And we're like, no way. It's so not the type. Like she doesn't, like she doesn't look like she has money. And you're like... Yeah, those are the kids that do, right? So that's like the outside versus the inside, or like somebody whose life looks perfect on the outside. You don't know what their struggles are on the inside. Like, happens to be like right, right before my father was left there, actually. Um, I was at PTA, and I was walking, I was actually with Rifki Nachman, and we were just like walking, and then we met somebody in the class, and she was like, like, oh, hey, why are you like shooting the breeze, like waiting online, like, is it my turn yet? Did she cut her mind? Like, you know, those people who like come, and they're like, I really have to go, can I just cut you? And I'm like, no, I'm here for six hours. Like, Darche, by the way, the worst PTA system. If you ever got stuck at Darche, it's ours, right? So as I was leaving, whatever, this girl, we're like, oh, so nice to see you, how are you doing? And she's like, well, I just got it from Shiva. And I was like, 
Oh my God. Like, I was like, I, I literally, my face went to melt and I'm like, you, you look on the outside, I'm like, everybody looks perfect and everybody's life looks okay and she's posting on the class chat or whatever and I'm just like, I didn't even know and like, you have no idea what the struggles were and then like, a few weeks later, my father was after her and then like, did it to a few people, but it's not so nice. They're like, oh, why do you have it? I'm like, because I'm in a villa. Like, but that's not nice. Like, that wasn't the right thing to do, but I have to control the urge, by the way, to do that. Like, it's not so nice. But that's the thing. You don't know what's going on behind, but outside, it's perfect. And it's such a perfect example for us to understand what the Benoni is feeling and what their struggle is. And by the way, what does that lead us to? And this is where, like, I love Tanya, because immediately, if we don't understand what people are going through, what is this leading, like, what's the next thing? What does the Balatanya, like, always go to? What's his, like, go-to thing? And this is, I think, like, a big message that our Rav is, like, giving is that Avas Yisrael. What is this going to lead you to? When you realize that you don't know what's going on in anybody's life and you have no idea what their struggles are, what's it going to lead you to? Avas Chinam, Avas Yisrael, Ava Rabba. The way that the Balatanya explains is Ava Rabba. This leads you to love. So, like, I feel like this whole introduction that we were just, like, bringing to you is that what is the lesson of the Benoni is that you have to love every single yid. You have no idea what anybody's struggling with, and even if it looks like it's perfect, and by the way, even if it doesn't look perfect, and if it, and maybe whatever it is, you don't know what it is. This automatically leads us to Ava. So when can the when can the Benoni attain perfection? Remember we spoke about this last week. There's two times that he can attain it. Shema, Shema, and overall tefillah. So really, so overall davening, and when you're saying Shema, you can attain perfection and meditate on that when you're thinking about it. Um, and it says, "Ki amahusa batzmusa shal nefesh of Mahamis sheme haklipa bechlal hasmoli velo nitcha klal mimuka mimikoma benoni." Because in the benoni, the animal soul, the emotional deep core of the klipa in the heart of the left chamber, is not displaced at all. It's right there. Where is the nefesh of Mahamis displaced and not really there? In in who? In which character is there no nefesh of Mahamis? In the tzaddik. The tzaddik is like. So here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying that the Benoni experiences this in Mamashas. He actually experiences something that the Tzaddik doesn't experience. He has this. It's not displaced. place that it's right there. If you spend a minute in his head, you can't even imagine what he's thinking and what he's feeling. But what happens? So it's perfect. Achar, tefillah, she'ein rifshi, that it's not really evident that he's not perfect only until after prayer. Achar ha'tefillah. The Benoni will have his nervous breakdown after shachar. After davening. When he's in davening, he experiences bliss. It's perfect, right? But then all of a sudden, when he finishes davening, this fiery, flaming love from Hashem that's no longer awakened in his heart in the right chamber. So, by the way, you could live off that davening. He says that you could take that davening, there's like a reshima, like a, like a residue of that davening that stays with you. So, this is why I'm trying to daven for a little bit longer, because I'm like, maybe if I daven for longer, then I have a longer, like, residue of it. You know, like, okay, brachos, modani is good. That gets me an hour. But maybe that longer davening, and I try to push myself. Like, I don't know if I could handle it every day and every morning, but it's something that, like, I'm working through. But I'm like, the longer you spend in davening, then the residue stays longer. So, I want to be more tzaddik-like, so I'll do that. Um, so he says, after prayer, during the rest of the day, the Benoni's heart is inlaid inside with love, but only a milder form of it. So it says, um, it's Ava Misuteres. Remember that Ava Misuteres from the first time? Anybody remembers it? It's that late in love that's over there. And it stays there. It like hangs out there. It's like, oh, that was such a good davening. Figi, like there was such a beautiful bar shamar. Sometimes I sing it because it helps, right? And then like, I don't know if anybody else sings it. Isn't it weird? Like certain things like just come back to you like in a song, like Az Yashir. Like why am I still singing Az Yashir? I'm 38 years old. Um, but sometimes when you sing it, you remember it. Like it, it comes back to you. Okay. So he ava hativish of an kiss, which is the innate love of the divine soul, um, which he explains later, which we're going to learn in like chapters 18 through 24. Okay. So there's um, an impulse thought that the animal soul sends up and he's like, ooh, can I use the car today? Like, I think about that every with my daughter. Can I have the car? Can I have the car? And I'm just like, no, can't have the car. You can't come in. Can I just go for coffee and I'll be back and I'll bring? No, you can't even have the car just go for coffee because you're never back on time, right? That's what you have to tell Nefshah Muhammad. So Nefshah is like, can I tell it to you now? Can I do something now? And you're like, no, not now. You don't have control now. And you know what? I'm gonna dive in right now to make sure that you don't bother me for the rest of the day. Like literally, you have to have conversations with your Nefshah Muhammad. Like. You're not like, it, remember, it's not a bipolar thing. You're actually comprised of two things. You have these two parts inside of you. And then it says, And then after that, there's 
the, the stupidity of your Nefesh Bahamas starts to get squashed with your brain. Your brain says, go back down. Like the burp that wants to come up, say, just go back down. Go downstairs. Go downstairs. Go back to the basement. You know, like when the kids are bothering you, go to the basement. Go to the basement. That's, by the way, the muscle that we compare, the Nefesh Bahamas to the children and your brain to the parents. And it's like, no, time for pajamas, time for bed. I'm not sure why she's not in camp today, but she's watching, so... I hear that also. I'm like that. She won today. Um, okay. So nevertheless, so what is this? He's saying that in the case of desire for something forbidden, it does not cross the mind to actually violate it. So remember, you'll have these impulses, but you don't have to act on them. And then, um, okay, hold on one second. I'm going to go drop faster because I see it's getting late. Um, I want to go to that part of like loving every year. Hold on. Okay, so I'm going to skip a little bit. And we're going to go, Like, don't only think that this is between you and Hashem. These are the thoughts. This is you. Don't think it's only about, like, godly thoughts. This is about you and every single thing. Also, in human relationships, the Benoni has this complete self-control. Like, when it rises from the animal soul, it's like, ooh, it's coming up, it's coming up, and it's, let's say, jealousy, let's say it's a grudge, let's say it keeps coming up as it's coming up. And it doesn't, he doesn't let that thought come into like an ill will or a hatred. So let's say like, let's say it's a grudge. I'm mad at her. She did something wrong and I'm literally so mad at her. And it's like, okay, but you don't have to be mad at her. But every time the grudge comes up, it comes a little bit stronger because it's like literally like it's putting in its bids. You know, like when you watch like those, those auction shows, like 25, 100, 2,000 over there, right? When they're selling alias. And I always like, I'm like, what? Who keeps control of these alias? Like, where does it go? Um, I don't know if anybody ever hears it. So, like on Yom Kippur. It's like always hours on Yom Kippur. That's like when I actually hear them selling alias. But it's, it's taking bids. But you don't have to accept the bid and he won't accept it. So now here's the thing. So let's say like, we want to just say like, I'm human, I'm a person, I'm not an animal, and I actually have a brain and I can control my impulses. That's kind of like how you want to bring it down to. Like when we say an animal soul, like just imagine a zebra. A zebra will eat animals like alive, right? I don't know, are they carnivores? Do they do that? Lions, fine. Lions will, right? They have controls. They have urges that they cannot control. If they need to eat an antelope, they will eat an antelope. Like, if I can control myself, like, I'll control myself. Like, we have that ability, and that's because we have a godly soul. We're not an animal soul. So, like, sometimes if you want to go primitive, you could be like, listen, I'm not an animal. Like, I'm not going to let those thoughts and those feelings control me, and I'm going to be able to push it down. And then, and he should tolerate to extreme limits without becoming angry. And it says, like, God forbid, and also you should refrain from repaying the antagonist just because he deserves it. So it's very hard. I like personally struggle with this a lot. I know, okay, I like sometimes I'm like, should I go personal, should I not? But like, maybe I think just women in general, like we just have like a very big like bag for grudges. Like it's very big, it's not just like a clutch, it's like a big one and like you could fill it with stuff. And it's like parents and it's carpool situations and it's somebody actually hurt your feelings and somebody and it's like somehow like this bag just keeps getting bigger and bigger like sometimes I'll open my mouth to my husband and he's like amazing with Lashonara and he's like I don't want to hear it but sometimes it's like simmering there and it's like really it bubbles up so much that it gets to the point of like they actually deserve punishment like maybe that person really deserves to not have something good I know this sounds crazy but like you people will start to think to the point where somebody doesn't deserve it and the Baal says, no, Ella, like literally, rather on the contrary, what do you have to do? And this is pretty crazy. And this is from Berchas HaGomel, when we bench Gomel, right? When do we bench Gomel? After, like, after, after, some, after we survive something, after a miracle, right? Like after we have a baby, which is a miracle. And after you survive a car accident, after somebody has a crazy story, you bench Gomel. When we bench Gomel, what we're saying is, Adabra Ligmol Chayavim Tovos. We thank Hashem for doing something, even though we didn't deserve it. And the minute that you don't judge that person and the minute that you empty out your bag of grudges or whatever you're feeling, literally he refers to it here, he says it's like a grudge that you hold, you, you want to hold justice, you want to bring somebody else to justice for something that they did wrong, <coughs> whether it's like silly or they took my carpool turn or they forgot to do carpool, I don't know why I'm just using carpool because like it's the beginning of the year and we're all starting new carpools unless you have a carpool since you're in kindergarten, but 
I clearly don't because I just moved to Lawrence and I drive my kids every single Sunday. So I'm looking for a carpool. Uh, you know, it's like I'm looking for a man of I'm like, no, I'm looking for a six-person carpool to take me to Dache, clean car, and no car seats. Like, literally, like, that's what I need. Because then the car seats just start taking out the car seats and putting back. But, like, somehow, like, I literally still have this grudge of a person who's like, I'm only going to change carpools with you if you could do a turn for me. And I'm like, are you, what, what? Like, why can't you just be nice and do carpool, right? Like, by the way, the week of Shiva, like, I was so out of it. And then, like, the week after, I was so out of it. And then, like, the third week, I'm like, can I still pull this card? Like, you know? <laughs> but in terms of grudges, he says, no. He says, what do you have to do? Repay the guilty with positive acts. That's literally how the parak ends. And it says, Kamosh Fasub Bizoar, they'll mold me Yosef and Machav. As stated in the Zohar, that we should learn from Yosef and his brothers. So, like, Yosef and his brothers. Like, what was that story? They were so jealous of him. And then what happened? Like, oh my God, he saved them. And you could have been like, put all of you in a garbage can. You sold me. You sent me down here. And he was like, literally, he hugged them, kissed them, gave them riches, built them an entire city to live in. Are you kidding me? Like, he could have gone like, I could actually put all of you in jail. And he did it. And we learned this from Berchus Agoma, where like, and I, I, I think about this a lot, like a lot is like, if you want to have divinity in your life, if you want to have Hashem in your life, you have to act like Hashem. And Hashem doesn't pay back sinners. Hashem doesn't go over there and say, you were bad, and you were a bad boy, and you were a bad boy. Hashem says, you have a Benoni moment, you're amazing. You have good inside of you. I have no idea what's going on in your life. And when we judge people favorably and we do good for them, even when they deserve justice, and by the way, like Shay's put a disclaimer here and saying, like, remember to be careful of the Russia Viralo, because the Russia Viralo is a very scary person. It's a person who doesn't really want good in this world. It's not the not just a sociopath, it's somebody who doesn't feel bad about the things they did and they are dangerous. Not that we have to go change them, but not that you have to interact with them. But like maybe put them in jail, but go visit them and like visiting hours. Like, I don't know. Like he said, like the example he gave is like, okay, you could tell them you did wrong, but then bake them a cake. That's like literally what he said. Like bake them a cake, bring them a chal. Like just knock on their door, just be nice. And they're like, what? She didn't accept me into her carpool. Why would I bring her a potato call or a shot? It's like, no. Well, she just moved. Okay, but she didn't put me in my carpool. But like, and then it's like, your head starts going all these places and you're like, no, Figgy, like you have no idea what's going on in her life. Like, maybe she just, whatever, you can go to crazy extremes and start being done with and be like, why did they end up in McDonald's? Like, oh, she's pregnant and she needs a Diet Coke from McDonald's, right? Like, a fountain soda. You know, you don't even have to go there. You just have to be like, they're a yid and they're good. But they wronged me. It doesn't matter. You want to be like, you want divinity in your life? You want Hashem in your life? Act like Hashem. Hashem doesn't do that. What does Hashem do? Hashem is gomel achayavim tovos. Gomel achayavim, somebody who's chayav, somebody who deserves judgment, and he gives him tov. And you go visit them, and you daven for them. I tell people all the time, people who I'm mad at, I daven for them. Give me your kittel, like, I'll daven for you. Like, because it's just like my way of being like, simmer down, Figi. Like, they're a yid, yes, and look at their nishanas. Oh my gosh, such beautiful language. Yeah, otherwise you're just, otherwise you're just like, it's, it's like simmering. And like, the fact that it says it, it's like, if someone's mean or hurtful to you, like literally this is like the practical lesson, it's only happening because Hashem felt that that would be helpful for the evolution of your soul. I like literally like I highlight it. I'm like, that's amazing. That means that if somebody wronged you and if someone's annoying you or somebody did something really not nice to you, it's a tikkun for your neshama. So you think you got embarrassed, that person embarrassed you, that's a terrible person. No, my neshama needed like some humility. For your own growth. For your own growth, yeah. Somebody called me out, you're right, I was wrong. I have this sometimes. Like parents at work, they like call me out and I'm like, Go! when they like they're like how long have you work at this job i'm like 14 years okay like i'm much better and then i'm like one second like she's a person like what am i doing here right like and it's like the craziest thing that you're like why should i be nice to you you wronged me you you then cc'd my cheer person and told me that i'm a terrible person like and then i'm like you were wrong and by the way like when this happened my cheer person actually called me and she's like figgy you were right but i was like but it was a moment for humility she called me and cc 13 people on that email like every single person like and i'm just like but obviously I needed a dose of humility and I was just like, you're right. As much as I think I've been doing this and I'm good at it and I have people skills, no, my soul needed it, my neshama needed it. And that's exactly this, like, per you'd be, of Tanya. It's like, you don't ever seek revenge on people that hurt you. I know we're like, no, I don't, re I don't take revenge. We don't take revenge. Sometimes, I don't know, this is getting a little too personal, but like, <laughs> I, I love everybody in my carpool, like I do. Um, but actually he says like, you should be nice to them 
because despite their like malicious intent or whatever they were thinking, either they have caused you to learn an important lesson or they done something that will benefit you later on. And it's like very, very true. Like I, I had this when like my Nahama was going through a thing and she was like on a feeding tube and it was like the hardest time of my life. And anytime I was working with a parent who was like on a GI, like a, had a G tube or an NG tube, like all of a sudden I was like so much nicer to them. And I just like spoke to them with, and I'm like, wow, this experience, even though this mother is crazy, is making me a better clinician. It's making me more humble. It's opening up my eyes more. And I try to practice it. And you talk it into yourself until it actually does. Like, oh, this person is my neighbor and she's really annoying. Wow, Hashem put her right next to me for a reason. That means my neshama needed some kind of tikkun. And it's a new perspective of it. It's like, this is where Tanya, like it takes what you think is at face value and it like strips it back to like, we're all neshamas, we all come from the same place, we're all here to do a job. And the fact that that neshama is in my neshama circle, like maybe she's my neighbor, maybe she's my friend, maybe she's a coworker, it means there's some interaction that she has to pass my neshama and my neshama has to pass it. And by the way, the second you're done that thing, that person's not in your life anymore. Do you notice that? Or you're like, no, everybody is still here. It's not even just people. It's not even, and then you're like, okay, still got work to do. I still have work to do. Um, I think about it with kids. I don't know, maybe this is something that like when, like maybe I was experiencing it like a little empty nest syndrome when I sent four kids off to camp and I'm just like, oh, they're not here now. And like, I was sad about it or I was happy about it sometimes, but I'm like, obviously the, there's a space now of eight weeks that maybe I have to focus my attention on something else. But if they're not here, that means they're not exactly in Don't worry, they're staff, they call me every five minutes. I know it's exactly what's happening in their life, but that intense contact is no longer needed. And it's the same thing with people. Like as, and, and by the way, Zidin and Gullus, like when we experience certain moments of Gullus, we had to be in Spain at that time. We had to be in Greece. We have to be in America. But like according to Rabbi Yassi, we could be our own like, based in and we can make our own decision. We could say we're done here. Like we're done in America. Whatever work we needed to do, we are done. I honestly think that like when Biden, like this is just my thing, like when he left the race, whatever, I was like, we are done in America, we can move on. Like we moved on, like whatever's happening with the presidency, like it's just, we're laughing at it because we can look and say like, we can be done here. Like, I don't know if anybody has the time or wants to listen to whoever Moshe Weinberger spoke on Tisha B'Av and it was incredible. And he basically was like, we're wrapping up, let's go. Like. And that's because our neshamos did our job here. And what's our neshamos? What is our generation's thing? It's avas chinam. It's all like, you have to live kmocha. It's a very, very strong connection to other yedin. And like Rabbi Yassi says this whole time, like why do you think that we know what's happening in the world all the time now? Like people could be like, oh, it's so annoying. Like during the Holocaust, like there were literally people in America that did not know what's happening. Here, we know every single thing that's happening. Well, I definitely know what's happening in the south of France, but like, because I see everybody's pictures, but like, we know what's happening all over the world. And you could be like, oh my God, that's too much information. Or you can say the fact that I know that everything that happened in the world is bringing the tikkun, it's bringing us Yidin closer. Like October 7th, no matter what brought Yidin out of like, it brought more Yidin out of tunnels than in tunnels. And those tikkunim that are happening, whatever's happening under the tunnels, I know they just like recovered six bodies and I'm just like, I can't just not, you can't just not talk about it, you can't just not think about it, but like, as they're pulling out more of the good that was in the bad, that's our avoda of avoda sabiru. The more we see each other as neshamas, the closer we'll bring the gu'ula. It's schar mitzvah mitzvah. It's like, you can bring the gu'ula faster by loving every single year. This parak of like binoni is not just like, oh, it's in here and it's very practical and it's something about tiny talk. It's like something that we have to practice every single day. I have no idea what anybody's internal struggles are. I will never judge another yid. I'm already at Benoni level. And I can have more tzaddik like moments. Like, that's it. Like, we're not even, it's not even so hard to be a Benoni. If it means just by judging everybody a drop more favorably, that's bringing out the good. That's the little bit of light that dispels a ton of darkness. You don't have to pack it anywhere. You don't have to put it in a carry-on. You don't have to put it in your, oh my God, my bags are so overweight. And then I, like, I end, honestly, I don't think I told you this, but he ended up taking like half my luggage and putting it under. And I was like, literally like saying to you, for my luggage. It was just on like one flight. Mm. But anyway, sorry, I got emotional because I'm like, sometimes I feel like I can and it's like a moment, but it's such a, it's a very, very practical takeaway. Like sometimes I walk out of here, I'm like, yeah, we're not Russians, we're not Tadik, but like we are being on him and we want to work on this and that's really what it is. Okay, any questions? I feel like it was very quiet. Last week there was so much talking and like we didn't get in, but it was like calm today. Um, okay, with you. I'm going to end this here. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining. Okay, yeah. Um, so I find that like when I focus on, like everyone's neshama is like a pawn, things, your emotions are not involved, and then you can easily 
help that person or even let, let their feelings or emotions or how they behave. It's like, you're not getting your emotions involved. Like, they're pawns to be here to do this, whether it's good or bad. And yeah. by them being little pawns, they're just like, you're not emotionally attached to these things, so you like let it go. Like, you know, like you're done with that outfit, you throw it in the garbage. When you're really like emotionally, like, oh my gosh, I wear this in my bar, I'm gonna keep it forever. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then you just could, you could just, what does it mean if I throw everything out? <laughs> I throw it. That's how I clean up on Shabbos. Like I clean up with a garbage bag. Like how can you probably also do? No. Yeah. Um, I just find that it, by not having your emotions involved, you tend to just love people more. You're you're not like resentful. Not taking you're it personally, hurtful, right? Yeah. And then you could just find much more good in in people, and like you mm -hmm. could just connect Hashem in other ways. Right. It's so deep. It's like the last time I was telling you. It's tons community. of work. No, it's tons of work. But I always said this, like when I was working on my Lashon Hara, like, and I'm still always working on it, not like on speaking good. It's like one person at a time. One person at a time. Give it a week. Give it, like, I know there's like all these Mahsam Lafis, and I'm like, if it's, you find that it's one person, then let it just be that one person. And then just you end up finding good, and then you end up bringing them Kika Khalas. Like, it ends up happening because you foster a giving relationship, and the more you give, the more you care about them. So why do I care about this person who did something wrong, but I'm somehow I'm helping them. I offered to do their carpool. How about that? No one's gonna wanna ever carpool with me. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna end this here. Thank you all for joining.